morning, everyone. Um, my name's Adam Tuzin. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, extraordinarily timely panel uh, on a Monday at Davos on economic weaponry uh, uses and effectiveness of sanctions. Uh, we have the distinct pleasure and indeed honor to have with us today the first Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy of Ukraine, uh, Yulia Sivirdenko. Yes. Uh, we have um, with us also Congresswoman from Missouri, uh, Second District, Anne Wagner. Uh, we also have with us today Eric Cantor, who will be familiar to many of you from his long and distinguished career in Congress and is now the Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Mullison Company USA. And uh, bringing up the Far left-hand side, um, <laughs> uh, we have John Morrison, uh, CEO of the Institute for Human Rights and Business, uh, based in the UK. Uh, we're going to run this uh, as a series of initial interventions from the panel up here. We're going to go back and forth. I will look for interventions from the floor. I've also got my laptop here, which will feed in questions from the outside, and we'll finish sharp um, on 45 minutes. So without further ado, can I ask... First Deputy Prime Minister um, Sirudenko to give us your take on where we're at with the sanctions story okay. in the Ukraine right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so first I would like uh, to start my speech with the words of uh, thankful and uh, to express my gratitude to all these countries, to all these people uh, that support Ukraine during these dramatic times. So. Uh, for, we're really gratitude for those one who support and put Ukrainian lives you know, about the uh, economic and political benefits from Russia, who puts Ukrainian life about the uh, oil and gas from Russia. So we're re really grateful for our partners and friends. Uh, so Russian full uh, scale invasion to Ukraine, I think, uh, put the world on edge. And now there is no time and no room for a neutral position, no time and room for a weak decision as this war affects every country. So actually Russia uses uh, its leverage like a weapon. I mean food, energy, resources. Uh, now it's treat the world with a world hunger. So that's why I think the actions are intentional and uh, sanction against Russia, there should be reaction on its weaponizing of everything. Uh, in general, uh, economic sanction used uh, in the modern world like uh, tools of pressure. And in 2014, uh, our partners, they applied uh, sanction against Russia, but now we understand that it was not successfully and fully enough. That's for sure. So the current situation is totally different. So Russia wants to destroy Ukraine. So Obviously, they kill people, they kill children, they destroy the economy, and they uh, frighten the world, world uh, with a world, world hunger that might appear. So that's, that's why uh, there is definitely no time for cost and benefit analysis. So we just need to cut Russia from the civilized world entirely. This is our main message uh, that I would like to, to, to speak about. And uh, uh, we appreciate, uh, appreciate the sanction that was applied by our partners, but let, let's look at the number, let's look at the situation in general. So if you look at the forecast of uh, Russian economy, you will uh, look at that, uh, according to, to consensus analysis, uh, the Russian economy is going to be, uh, I think, shrink by 10% of GDP uh, till the year. So, but in, if you compare it with situation in Ukraine, because it's also, you know, we have military front and we have economic front right now. And we, if you look at the hour forecast, I think the uh, economy of Ukraine will be shrink by at least 30% of GDP till the end of the year. So that's why it means that we need your support more and we need more full-scale sanction against Russia. Because economic front is a, it's not uh, least front and, you know, army, uh, wins battles, but economy <coughs> wins wars. That's why we need your fully economic support to win in this war. So I think that together we need more support for Ukraine and, uh, and uh, more sanction against Russia. So I, even right now in Davos, we don't have Russian delegation. And I think that they should not be the part of global conversation and they should not be the part of global economy. And I think that it's time to unite the world. And 
I think I also would like to mention, you know, China and India as well. They also to also provide sanction against Russia. Uh, the economic front actually even more complicated than the military front. For example, there are huge uh, efforts is made by our partners to provide uh, the second, uh, the sixth package of sanction against Russia on oil and gas. But uh, in parallel, there are some European companies that are opening account for paying for Russian gas. So that's why Russia capitalized in this case. Russia capitalized right now even on food crisis. Our uh, Black Sea ports are fully blocked. And that's why it's also another message I would like to send to you. We need your help to unblock the seaports. Mines. Yes. Because even on right now, Russia capitalized on food and you know the price for wheat even higher than what it was previous at the previous years. So it means that it's a paradox that should be fixed. It means that sanction is not good enough. It's paradox. But we can fix it together with you. Uh, last and the, not the least, you know, many companies announced that they leave Russian markets. There was many press release for this company, but the uh, real situation is following. So uh, they announced, but they still operating on Russian market. And uh, there is, they, they have time to adopt to this sanction. That's why it means that we should think about um, the secondary sanction, how mm -hmm. we can block it, uh, to, to block any uh, circumventions. So uh, that's why I think the government <coughs> should be more proactive in increasing in enlarging sanction against Russia, I mean secondary sanction and uh, the ordinary sanction. And the final remarks uh, I would like to speak about it, of course, uh, frozen, frozen Russian assets. It's time for Ukraine right now to, to think about recovery plan. All the recovery and post-war recovery, we have these frozen assets all around the world and we need to find a clear procedure and clear solution, solution how to send this money from these frozen assets on the reconstruction of Ukraine. And that's why I think it's also another item I would like to raise during this discussion and uh, listen to your ideas and, and, and think how we can together find against uh, this invasion as we understand uh, that it's real full-scale war. It's not a conflict mm. and it uh, influence all countries. That's why I think that to solve this problem, we can just all together by su more supporting Ukraine, economic front of Ukraine, and by increasing sanction against Russia. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That phrase, uh, uh, it's not a conflict, it's a real full-scale war, is going to resonate with me. Um, Anne, it yes. would be great to get your response. America has been leading on the sanctions charge, and to get the view from Congress is invaluable at this stage. Thank you. I, I appreciate it very much. Wonderful to be uh, with the Deputy uh, Prime Minister and Minister of uh, Economics in Ukraine, with my distinguished colleagues. I had the pleasure of serving with Eric uh, Cantor for uh, a number of years. And most of all, welcome and thanks to all of you who, who got up bright and early to be, uh, to be here. I, I went on a delegate, I serve on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, number two ranking Republican, and on the House Financial Services Committee. So we've had a lot uh, of integration, especially vis-a-vis -vis OFAC and others in terms of imposing uh, sanctions. It was one of the very first delegations, five days into the war, that went to Poland and to the border of Ukraine with colleagues on a bipartisan basis, speaking as one America. Uh, and I'm part of a delegation now that uh, just left Moldova, okay, and uh, I'm here, and then on to uh, two other stops. And this is a, a, a very top uh, issue here. And I can tell you, <coughs> sanctions, I believe, are a critical tool um, in restraining the ambitious and destructive impulses of um, adversary states. They are, they're, they're very difficult to craft and to implement, let me just say. And using our economic tools effectively require a very clear, I think, and, oops, pardon me, consistent, consistent uh, message. Uh, ironclad commitment to long-term um, implementation and a, an exhaustive attention to detail. Oh, I'm gonna lose all my pages here, to detail. But that, just because they're difficult does not mean that uh, we should not try. Uh, for example, genocide. 
nuclear proliferation or invading a sovereign state or country uh, without reason or provocation are egregious affronts to the international order. And it is appropriate and it is right that uh, states should work together to impose costs on those who would commit such crimes. Uh, our our post-war international system, which is founded on the rule of law and respect for, human, for universal human rights, benefits all of us, I think, but it requires active defense. Uh, economic sanctions are an essential part uh, of our efforts to safeguard international security. Um, I, I should say the sanctions must be used to bring about a positive change in behavior. I believe that they are a tactic, not a strategy. Um, and I will say that sanctions against uh, Russia on the, on the part of the United States of America and, and others, I wish that our administration had worked sooner. We saw the buildup of 190,000 troops uh, on the border. I believe they could have been used to perhaps um, stop the aggression, the invasion, the now full-on war that we are seeing uh, in, in Ukraine now. So fine that they're in place now, we should unify together, but I believe they should have been started much, much earlier. And I'd like to focus a little bit on the oligarchs, and you talked a little bit about the assets. And um, it, not enough has been done to, to impose uh, pain, I don't believe, on Russia's elite. Uh, they are fully complicit in Russia's regime, and Western countries should coordinate to maximize the economic pressure on oligarchs and their families. Um, the United States House of Representatives in Congress uh, has passed legislation uh, that the U.S. for them to be able to, to seize, okay, seize, not just freeze, but to seize um, those assets and, uh, and use the proceeds to support everything from humanitarian assistance for Ukraine um, uh, to military support also. So, uh, and, and it's in time, we hope, the rebuilding. Uh, the Russian elite must understand uh, that continued support uh, for Putin is no longer in their interest. Next, I think we have to work together to end Europe's reliance on Russia to enable tougher sanctions. I called for a U.S. ban on Russian energy imports for months. Uh, and I believe this was an extremely important move to demonstrate to our partners that we have the will to follow through on economic sanctions on Russia in the long term. And now we need to accelerate Europe's efforts to transition away from Russian energy. They, uh, they still have massive dependence on Russian energy, and we should be working overtime to help our partners open up new sources. And I, I, I would hope that the United States of America could be very much a part of that in terms of unleashing our American energy uh, supply in independence. I, I believe we're the Saudi Arabia of LNG, and we should be selling it to Europe. It's 41% cleaner, and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and these are the kinds of sources that I think are very important um, uh, and it would be, be a, a, a cut off of a very important revenue source for Putin. Uh, we've got to make the sanctions airtight uh, and, and impose tough penalties. And secondary sanctions, I do believe, are, are now in order. Uh, so those that aid uh, the Russian effort by circumventing these sanctions, uh, we must uh, work in close coordination with our partners uh, and allies to identify and punish the sanction evaders. And that is what I'm talking about now. And they should also be fully not partially, not partially cut off from SWIFT. Um, last, I would say that we must set up a, the political pressure on Russia also. And the U.S. and our allies have levied punishing sanctions, uh, but, uh, and, and, and I would say there, they are costing an immense uh, uh, cost to Moscow, but there need to be diplomatic costs as well. And that means leaving Russian officials and government uh, literally from the outside looking in. I just passed a piece of legislation uh, through, uh, through the U.S. House of Representatives. I hope that it will be moving swiftly through the Senate, which is called the Isolate Russian Government Officials Act, um, that would bar, bar their attendance from the G20, uh, the Bank of International Settlements, the Basel Committee for Banking Standards, the Financial Stability Board, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, and the International Organization of Securities Commissions. I think that benefiting from these international uh, and participating in these organizations, uh, including the ones in my bill, uh, calls for a, a basic level of commitment to our international order. And 
um, uh, uh, unleasing and, and launching this illegal uh, and unilateral, unprovoked, unwarranted attack on Ukraine was wholly Putin's choice uh, and his alone. Uh, so it's his choice now to bring Russia back into the fold, the international committee, uh, community, by ending this war. That is the only way he should be allowed back in. And I look forward to working uh, with you and our, our world partners to come together and to make sure that these sanctions continue to be imposed. Go after the oligarchs. Make sure that there's some energy independence. Um, secondary sanctions, I believe, are, uh, are in order, and I want them isolated diplomatically. And uh, the world community must continue to pull together. So I thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, um, for that uh, overview of the view from the United States and for raising the issue of Europe, to which I think we will have to return in the next round, if you like. Eric, on this panel, you are, I think, the elder statesman um, uh, in the room, um, spry as you are. And uh, one of the sets of sanctions moves that America was involved in at, a, at your, your, your period in, in Congress was, was Iran. So what lessons do you see from that experience for our current situation? Anne was saying that she wished that we'd moved sooner. Um, is that an, a lesson that you draw too? Well, Adam, first of all, thank you uh, for, for having us and for everyone for being here. And I know you've written extensively on sanctions and um, have, have always said that uh, we've got to bear in mind what the purpose of sanctions are. Uh, and I think it's relevant to the Iran discussion. But first, I want to, as we used to say in, in the House, associate myself with the remarks of the gentlelady from Missouri um, <laughs> that, uh, um, as usual, I'm uh, very much in sync with Ann Wagner and, and what she's saying as far as what the U.S. position should be in support of Ukraine. Uh, but let me get to the question about Iran and then bring in what you have written, I think, a little bit uh, from my take on what you've written about. And then number one, the sanctions, the purpose of sanctions can be either deterrence, it, it certainly can serve, they can serve as punishment, uh, and uh, they can also serve as, as rehabilitation, uh, which is like a change of behavior. In the case of Iran, um, I think those would say that um, there's, there may be a mixed bag on that. Uh, as you know, we've been through successive rounds of sanctions, uh, first imposed by President Obama and his administration uh, when uh, he embarked upon the discussions with the regime in Tehran and search of this agreement, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, there was a lot of consternation, especially on the Republicans' part in the Congress at the time. Uh, when I was serving as leader, was very much in opposition to that uh, because we felt at the time that sanctions were actually working vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Iran. And I think there are three, three reasons why those sanctions were working. One, there was uh, multilateral support, uh, and there was a lot of work that were being done uh, that the, to give the credit where it was due in the administration at the time to bring along our allies uh, in, in basically blacklisting uh, Tehran, its, its, its oil and gas exports, uh, and, and really um, trying to focus on getting a change of behavior. Uh, and it was very clear, that's the second piece, is what is the off-ramp, what are the reasons for the sanctions, and how does a country get out from under these sanctions? And I do think at the time, we we're very clear about that as well. We wanted them to stop their pursuit of a nuclear weapons program, uh, and there were other things that I felt some of us uh, wanted to see as a part of those sanctions as well about its malign behavior in the Middle East, in the, in, in the region with its proxies, but yet I do think they were very clear. And then thirdly, um, there was a, a mindfulness, if you will, about the stacking or the repetitiveness of sanctions. And at this point, after the Trump administration came in, as you know, and withdrew uh, the United States unilaterally uh, from the JCPOA, uh, we, we put on even more sanctions. And I think at this point, there are over 1,600 sanctions against individuals and entities in Iran. Uh, and now we're sort of back um, at a point where I'm not so sure there's going to be success. I doubt there will be success in arriving again at JCPOA. I was never in support of it before. I'm not in support of it now. Uh, I just think that the behavior by the regime in Iran uh, uh, will, not, will not change. And so the question now is, are those sanctions working? Well, you can certainly see they punished 
uh, the economy. I mean, their inflation is running at 42 uh, percent. Their currency, I think, is, has been halved uh, in value in the last several years. Uh, certainly, their oil production is severely down, although just as with the case in Russia, the, uh, the increase in the price of the commodity has allowed that regime in Iran to recover some of its revenues because of the increase in prices and, frankly, their ability to evade sanctions. So when we look to, and where the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister talked about the need for enhanced sanctions here, uh, in the case of, of Russia, um, I'm for uh, whatever we can to just tighten the vice. However, I, I do think we, we've got to go back to those cardinal rules. We've got to have multilateral support. Um, and we can't be, you know, we are accused in the United States of weaponizing the dollar through these sanctions. Uh, and I'm mindful of that. And I think we need to have a lot of discretion uh, when we are using the tools that come with the reserve currency of the world. Uh, because every time we use it, even our allies and our friends start to wonder, why is it that you can do this? And how are we going to make sure we don't uh, become subject to those sanctions. So I do think multilateral support, I think clear definition as to what these sanctions are for, uh, and how you get an off-ramp. And we've got a problem with this, this off-ramp, because just recently our Secretary of Defense Austin, uh, our Secretary of State Blinken in the region, um, and they talked about now we're not just trying to save Ukraine, we're going to win this war now. That's the goal. Now, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And we've got to tie that back in with the sanctions. And then lastly, on the, on the uh, Prime Minister's uh, uh, comments about secondary sanctions, uh, those are in place in Iran. Uh, and um, in the holistic set of sanctions uh, on Iran been pretty, pretty, pretty uh, effective in trying to impose those and enforce those. Uh, the problem is, as we know now, U.S.-China relationship uh, is, is very tense right now. What is, the, what is the situation with China and others uh, in terms of supporting these kind of secondary sanctions? If you look at the votes in the U.N. that went from condemnation to, of Russia back to pulling Russia and, and ejecting them from the uh, Commission on Human Rights, there were like 58 votes that pulled away from that vote, which seems to me we may not get that multilateral support of secondary sanctions. So I don't want to make sanctions something that don't work and are not an effective tool. So we'll have to work on that piece too. Thank you, Eric. That was extraordinarily illuminating, um, both I think in focusing on this question of, let's not call it the off-ramp, but the end goal yeah. and the conditionality and what in fact the, the aim is. I think. Deputy Prime Minister, you were very clear. We want this mm -hmm. war to end. We need the aggression to cease. We need Russia rolled back. Uh, but also, frankly speaking, about the, the, the degree of politicization of this issue in the United States. And this is a very interesting contrast between the extreme polarization over Iran, between the parties, and the extraordinary degree of unanimity that we're now seeing in Congress on, on Ukraine although, so far. Although, Anne will tell you, there are 57 yeah. members of the House of Representatives in, in our party that yeah. voted against the latest package, and 11 members of the Republicans out of 50 in the Senate that just voted against. So I'm not sure that unity will last. John, on that fascinating <laughs> moment, um, come on in. I mean, what, what's really interesting mm -hmm. and would be great to get from you is a sense also of the role of the private sector here, because that's really your metier, the, the business human rights dimension. Yeah. And self-sanctioning by firms has been a big element of the story. Big element, yes. Yeah. Sanctions bleeding into boycotts, I guess. Yeah. I mean, first of all, to associate myself, I think is the term we're using, with, with the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, I mean, as a human rights organization, we stand with Ukraine, we stand with civil society in Ukraine, with human rights defenders mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Um, and I just want to say that unambiguously, that, that, that there's an act of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a complete breakdown, I would say, in the norms of, of the society and the world in which we want to live. But we are talking about economic warfare. Um, let's be clear. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister said, Russia uses its leverage like a weapon. We're having a discussion about the, how the West should use its leverage like a weapon. And the difference between economic warfare and the warfare on the ground, where you have the Geneva Conventions, um, de developed in this country, what, 150, 200 years ago, is there are no rules when it comes to economic warfare, as we're hearing. I mean, there are a sense of Groundhog Day. And I remember 
Iran, I remember Sudan, I even remember the McBride principles for Northern Ireland, I'm, I'm that old. And there's an element of us trying to find those rules and those benchmarks each time mm -hmm. something comes along. Um, and it's very important we do learn from the past, and I, I'm going to try and take the long view here. You asked me, Adam, to think about it from the perspective of business. Well, I think for business, business should see this in three buckets, perhaps, and the buckets are not watertight, but they're, they're associated with each other. The first is in Ukraine itself. It makes a diff big difference as to whether you're in free Ukraine, occupied Ukraine, or in areas of conflict. You have the Geneva Conventions, which I've mentioned, humanitarian law, um, and other things to con uh, consider if you're in Ukraine itself. The second bucket is individual sanctions and acknowledging Magnitsky and everything that's developed over the past few years. A lot of work has gone in to create a sanctions regime around individuals that is clearly stated in human rights terms. That's very, very important. And so we should build on that, even in the context of, of the urgency of the moment. And then the third bucket is this broad-based sanctions around particular business sectors. And what I'm seeing also on some boards and some companies is withdrawal even above the requirements of sanctions. Companies are moving before they're being asked to move. Now, the third thing really then to say is, is we need to gather the evidence. And it's, it's, it's very important that, and I acknowledge the work around war crimes research that the government is doing at the moment, and the first trial that's already underway in Ukraine now, that we, we get the facts, we document the abuses the genocide, the international criminal violations that have taken place in the country. We need to create an evidence base for what are economic measures. But we're having, over recent weeks, in, in the Congress and all around the world, particularly in the West, big discussions now around what it means to target individuals versus whole populations. Who are the real violators? Who are the innocent? Are there any innocent in the context of Russia? Gross violations versus serious violations. And essential goods and services, medicines and food, should they be exempt from sanction regimes? Now, the short term, I think, is clearer. The long-term consequences of where we're going are less clear. A lot of this is trade distorting. Are we actually talking, if we think about all of these measures and everything that's happening, about the end of global free trade in the way we've discussed over the past 30 years at Davos and elsewhere? These broad-based sanctions, when do they become boycotts? When do we discover, when do we elaborate these rules of the road that boards and companies can use to decide when there's a, a fact-based approach to withdrawing from the Russian market? So I'll just end by saying three things. And I think, Eric, you said some of these things already. Be precise, the first thing. Be really precise. State the objectives, whether you're a government or a business, as to why you're disengaging from the Russian market. Cite your rationale within international law, human rights, corruption. Be very clear about why you're doing it. The second is to measure and evaluate. Beware of unattended consequences. And Eric, you've mentioned the diminishment of leverage over time in the context of Iran, possibly. How do we know in the medium to long term that the path we're walking down is actually having the purpose we intended. Magnitsky, again, allows us to measure the consequences in the terms of specific individuals. Broad-based sanctions, you're measuring the, the impact on a whole population. Beware of unintended consequences. And third, for boards, for corporate boards, and today we launched a report for boards in terms of their impacts on um, uh, affected stakeholders. Whatever your decision, Make sure that you, you, you put at the center the impact on the human being. So if you're withdrawing from the Russian market, make sure you're doing so responsibly. Responsible exit is, and responsible entry are key factors here in the discussion. Cutting and running, leaving staff and others in harm's way is no way to behave. So responsibility comes whatever your decision. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I'm not so far getting much... Uh flow of questions on the, not the gadget, the Slido gadget. So if you do have questions, please start winding them up. I see a range here. Um, I'm tempted to just put one uh, to, to uh, uh, First Deputy Prime Minister. Um, and it's, I think, the question that hangs in the room in a meeting that we are having in Europe. 
Um, and it's uncomfortable perhaps to talk about because we don't have a representative of the EU or in fact of Europe up on the panel here, but it's impossible I think to avoid the question. If we go beyond the formalities of cutting Russia out of the international system, if we're talking about concretely depriving them of access to the bit of the world economy that matters most, it is the European energy market that's decisive. And I don't know whether you feel free at this point to, to uh, say something on that score, but I think it would be very good to get, your, get the message from Keith uh, this morning on that, on that issue that is being debated all over the continent. Mm -hmm. So I think actually it's essential for us. And there is, there is no uh, like other answer than that uh, we are insisting on providing sanction. Like it's, I know that um, I think the most all countries in the EU are prepared this second package of sanction and there are you know uh, discussion very very uh, discussion inside but we insist that this package should be uh, implemented otherwise uh, there won't be you know uh, we're discussing we have you know very complicated discussion and there's going to be some complex question I think in, in this audience but the, but the question is sun, we will understand that sanction works just in case if this invasion will stop. Otherwise, there is no sense to discuss this partial sanction like SWIFT or partial sanction on ban of oil and gas. If the war is continuous, it means that sanction does not work at all. That's why we insist on the decision from EU side. We understand that need, I know from their side, they try to estimate what, how costly it's going to be for their economy. But from other side, there is Ukraine. We're sitting in a, in, in a good audience with you in, in, in a good room, and in parallel there is war landscape. It's, it's a real war, and uh, Ukraine economy loses every day, and we lose our people. And that's why I think that there is no other answer than EU should uh, launch the second package of sanction and to ban uh, the possibility to uh, purchase oil and gas from Russia. Thank you for that. But I think it's... It, it, it's if, I, if I could add on to that, um, cause, because it is important. In, in, in short, our adversaries, and certainly in this case uh, Putin and those that we're targeting, must understand that we are not bluffing in this. And the multilateral con uh, concept of everyone pulling together in this is absolutely uh, key. We must have a commitment uh, to impose severe costs uh, to those who threaten our, um, uh, our, our international stability and, uh, mm -hmm. and security. So messaging is important, uh, it is, but to the coming together is, is important. And as I said, in terms of energy, I mean, it's, it's tough. We look at the swift uh, uh, sanctions that are out there, but you look at the, those that are not included in that, Schmierink or, or Gazprom, um, it, it's, you know, this must be a, a very holistic thing. And, uh, and we, we must find other sources uh, for Europe. I believe the U.S. would be a wonderful source for LNG uh, and, and, and for, uh, for energy uh, to Europe. So I offer that uh, 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 once again. So. We've got a gentleman here with us. Yes. yes. Um, Ken Roth from Human Rights Watch. Um, I wanted to pick up on John's comments because I think it's very important that we distinguish between um, the Russian government, you know, the Kremlin, the military on the one hand, and the Russian people on the other. Because if you, if you look at you know, what's going to stop the atrocities, what's going to stop the invasion, arguably the Russian people are the most important. And you know, despite the censorship, despite the disinformation, despite the 15-year prison terms threatened, there have been anti-war demonstrations in 150 cities across Russia. Um, Putin is terrified of the possibility of a color revolution. And so it's important with the sanctions messaging and the reality to make clear that the Russian people are not the targets because we want them to see that you know, they, they can join with this anti-atrocity, anti-war message. Um, second quick point is that the most targeted sanction is prosecution. And the most effective institution here is the International Criminal Court. Now, the US government traditionally has said the International Criminal Court cannot prosecute anybody, even on the territory like Ukraine, which has accepted the court, if the war crime suspect, if his or her country has not joined the ICC. Now, Biden has changed that with respect to Ukraine, said it's okay to prosecute Russians even though Russia has not joined the ICC. 
but legislation in the US is still precluding full US cooperation with the International Criminal Court. And I hope, Representative Wagner, um, that you will join with current legislative efforts to allow full US cooperation with the International Criminal Court, even though theoretically the ICC at some point could prosecute an American or prosecute an Israeli. Those are not good enough reasons to block cooperation with the ICC today on Ukraine. Thank you very much, Ken, for that very pointed intervention. Could I ask whether or not, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, you accept that distinction between the government and the people in Russia? Is that, is that a logic that you follow in Kyiv in your understanding of how these sanctions should work? Because it's a classic liberal version. Uh, it's an argument that goes all the way back to the sanctioning of Iraq, at least, and if not before. It relies on focusing on oligarchs as one of the main mechanisms or the political leadership. Um, is that, from your experience as a country at war, a meaningful distinction at this point? We have in this room uh, our deputies from uh, Kiev, and uh, they raise their uh, hand, and they would like to answer that question, Yulia Klimenko, if you don't mind. <laughs> I'm Yulia Klimenko, I'm a member of parliament uh, of Ukraine, and I would like to answer this question. When you're saying about the difference between Russian uh, nation, which is destroyed de facto by Putin, by himself, uh, and uh, uh, Russian Kremlin um, government, tell me, the soldier that raped two uh, years old kid, he is Russian or not? Yes, he is Russian, and he is a part of Russian nation. And, he, and the Russian nation should be responsible for Kremlin that they actually elected and they are supporting. 75% of Russian supporting murders of Ukraine. What we are talking about here? What, about what values, economic uh, development and growth in Europe we are talking? If we allowed 75%, 75% it's official polls. It's not, I'm, I'm not taking it from my head. Uh, 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 accept and uh, actually um, prove and uh, they, um, how to say it, even uh, agree with the killing of Ukrainians. This nation, unfortunately, will be destroyed by his own government and his own president, by Putin. We are not destroying Russians. They are destroying this themselves. And they will do it by the end, unfortunately. And we will fight by the end. <laughs> Thank you very That's much for message. that powerful statement, which I think exposes a really quite fundamental conflict here. I would love to get your reaction, Anne, to the issue of the uh, ICC. I, I will say this, that the culpability um, rests squarely on exclusively, especially in the, the case of, uh, of, of Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine and, and with other targets, with the regimes that would see their citizens suffer um, uh, rather than risk the development of connections between the people in the outside world. Uh, you know, we, we do these in... in in a comprehensive plan to ensure humanitarian efforts are also uh, con uh, uh, out there, but they continue to be impeded. Uh, Putin is a man uh, that is uh, not only is, is, is bombing uh, hospitals and, and uh, uh, schools and uh, citizens, uh, he has blocked the humanitarian corridors. Uh, it is unheard of in, an, uh, uh, in a war of this, of this sort to block those kinds of corridors. The war crimes are absolutely, I think, key. And I think it is oftentimes, sadly, authoritarian regimes that um, will compound the pain of, 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 their, of their, their people and, and, and denying them that kind of, of, uh, of access. So uh, we look forward to uh, seeing, oh, I think the, the first, uh, we, we saw the first warm crime uh, a prosecution mm -hmm. uh, just uh, maybe this past week, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, in, in, uh, Gentlemen, yes. Um, I'll, I'm going to take two questions bundled, so I'll come forward to the lady in, 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 in Herrig Moan. Professor Tus, I'm resisting the temptation to ask you the question because it's a, a question about uh, the financial impact of, of the sanctions. Um, uh, do we know how useful? are the euros and the dollars the Russians are getting for European energy? Uh, because as we know, the central bank cannot handle that money. So do we suspect, do we have reason to believe that Russia is creating slush funds? Or is it useful to receive those euros and dollars just to stabilize the foreign exchange and avoid the hyperinflation? I think this is, goes to the you know, bottom line whether or not we mm -hmm. should pass sanctions on the energy. Thank you. And then at the front here. 
Thank you so much. Mina Larebi, The National. Um, I just want to talk about sanctions and take a step back and thank you for raising Iraq. I'm originally from Iraq. I wanted to ask about I sanctions on Iraq. So Iraq withdrew from Kuwait and the sanctions continued from 91 till 2003. And then the Saddam Hussein regime was removed by an American-led invasion. So what lessons have we learned from how sanctions were used in Iraq? And was that a strategy or a tactic? And what benefit was it to the eventual end of change in character and how Iraq acted? And when we talk about, of course, the impact on international law and order and peace and security, what you think the impact of the 2003 decision in Iraq had on some of the dimensions we're seeing now with the Ukraine invasion? Thank you so much. I'm going to bring one more in. Ricardo House at the front here. Then we'll wrap when we got our eye on the time here. Um, uh, on, uh, thank you, a fascinating panel. Uh, thank you for your uh, words and your courage. Um, I have a, a question um, regarding energy sanctions. Uh, the world obviously is undergoing you know, a period of high oil prices and, and people are concerned about energy security, energy affordability. And on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, Europe has been hesitant about being more aggressive and they've postponed say, adjustment for some future, but the war is now, it's not in the future. Uh, you want uh, yeah, to have an impact now, not later. Um, so <coughs> I have argued that the most effective way uh, to sanction Russia is not to embargo its oil, but to tax it. Russian oil needs to compete with oil from other parts that's not taxed, so they will have to eat the tax. And it, sh it shouldn't wait, uh, that it's just a matter of imposing a tax on uh, Russian oil and to use that money for many good things, for the reconstruction of Ukraine, uh, for helping the Ukrainian refugees, uh, for, for many, for helping Ukraine defense. Mm -hmm. So just tax the oil and tax it now. Uh, I must say that uh, I read recently in, in Reuters that Secretary Yellen uh, was pushing for that idea in the G7, uh, but I think that it should be put on the table. Tax Russian oil now. Thank you. Um, can I ask, um, is that a, an option that would be attractive to Kyiv as a, as a solution? It has, it has, on the one hand, a revenue raising element. It has, on the other hand, a rather liberal feel in the sense that if you still wanted to buy Russian oil, you could. Um, and it would be the Russians that paid the penalty. Is that, does that do the work that you would like to see from sanctions at this point? Actually, um, I absolutely agree that for us, for sanctions, it's uh, important uh, to, be, to have impact right now. And uh, we have the, our internal discussion, and we also consider this possibility to have a double, uh, like a extra taxation on the on the on the Russian oil and gas. But from uh, key point of view, from official point of view, so I think that uh, number one, it's ban ban of uh, export of oil and gas. So it's 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 our answer. We also have representative of Nanda Gas, uh, CEO of Nanda Gas. I also I think that he can comment Yuri Vitrenka if you don't oh, mind. Excellent. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Just speak loud. So yes. Just speak uh, in the tool. Fact, it's not even an alternative. So we are looking for a combination of a complete uh, bad embargo um, and a special duty and, again, some kind of escrow account mechanism that can be implemented through financial yeah. sanctions. And I will explain what I mean. So there are countries that uh, can afford at the moment to implement a full embargo. For example, even like Germany in terms of oil, they're saying, look, now we're ready for a full embargo on oil but we're not ready for a full embargo of a Russian pipeline gas, for example. People will freeze. Um, Hungary is saying, look, we're not ready for an embargo on Russian oil because, again, that's the only source of oil we can get because we don't have a seaport. Uh, so there can be a combination when, for example, some countries are saying, look, there is a full embargo. Not some countries. We're saying, as a general rule, it's a full embargo. embargo. Then there are some exemptions as a transitional arrangement for those countries who cannot implement the full embargo right now, they, are, they have to uh, use a special duty for, for example, pipeline oil, for, for pipeline uh, gas, where it's really like their critical dependence. We will also test, by the way, if they are sincere about uh, saying that they have a critical dependence. Because maybe yeah. with a special duty, we will all see that yeah. Russian oil is not just competitive, for example, in Hungary. So maybe some Hungarian firms, they just want a free ride, yeah. again, on this huge discount, for example, to Russian oil that we see at the moment. Uh, a similar situation, for example, with escrow account mechanism. 
we can say that even if you are buying Russian oil and gas, uh, you cannot uh, transfer all the money to Putin's regime. So at least uh, some part of this money should be frozen, seized. Again, it's, it's a different story uh, where there can be options, basically. But at least we should deprive Putin's regime of these billions of dollars he is getting every day from Europe to finance this barbaric war. Thank you so, so much. Because when people are arguing about different options, it's an excuse for them to do nothing. And that's exactly what is happening at the moment. Um, so we could spend all morning talking. Uh, we've had an incredibly rich uh, and complex discussion this morning. We're out of time, but I feel it's entirely appropriate to leave the last word this morning to the Ukrainian voice. And so I'll ask you to thank uh, all the contributors to this wonderful panel to join me in a round of applause. Thank you for being here. Thanks very much. For your